Hey, it's Jeff Zito, and welcome to another episode of the Celebrity Jobber Podcast. What would these celebrities be doing if not for being famous for what they're famous for? Who knows? What was their first job and their big break? How did they get to be famous in the first place? Sometimes it's just a lot of hard work over time, and then sometimes it's a a chance phone call. So I got a pretty crazy phone call from one Dwayne Dog Chapman. It was a few months ago, and, well, we'll get into that when we talk to Dog. But he called me out of the blue, and we started somewhat of a relationship. And now we're going to find out what this guy used to do before he was the most famous bounty hunter in the world. The Dog. Dwayne Dog Chapman, Dog the Bounty Hunter, is my guest this week on Celebrity Jobber. The Celebrity Jobber Podcast with Jeff Zito. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. But what if these celebrities weren't famous? What would they have become? What was their first job? We're about to find out. Dog. Yeah. How's it going, brother? Good, brother. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I just, I wanted to brag for a little bit, and I wanted everybody to know that it was a few months ago that Dog Unsolicited called the radio station to say, what did you say, Dog? You said, I love this station? Absolutely. Francie's grandson, my uh, her only grandson, elicits. He comes to Florida. He's 11. <laughs> And he's like, Grandpa Dog, put on that. What is that? 96. I go, it's 96.1. Uh, man, he listens and he's like, Grandpa, what is that? And I go, you're only 11. I'll tell you later. <laughs> so, so just food for thought. Well, I appreciate so, it. I appreciate it. So back to you. Where did yeah. you grow up? Where did you, Where were you a young pup? I was born in Denver, Colorado. And born, at, ironically, at Denver General, the welfare hospital. Really? So what did mom and dad do for a living? My father, my mother, first of all, was a fourth generation of uh, miracle-believing Christians. And she taught Sunday school, and she spoke to youth groups and stuff like that. So all my friends she spoke to. My father, who I found out just a few years ago, uh, after they all passed away... And my, my sister right behind me passed away. Before she died, she goes, oh, by the way, your dad was not your dad. Oh, no, Jesus. Your, your, your father, uh, my mom got drunk at 18 years old. She went to Colorado School of Mines at an Apache, uh, Chiricahua Apache guy, a year older than her. They got drunk together, and she had sex one time. And she called my dad on the, well, my grandpa drove her to the reservation, three months pregnant, and told the guy, you're coming to a shotgun wedding. And the guy said, no, I'm not. So my dad and my mom were raised across the street from each other. Oh, my gosh. So my dad always had a crush on my mother. So she sent a, a, a message to him, a telegraph on the ship in the Navy. If you come home right now, I'll marry you. And, of course, he flew home. And married her. So they even, and my mom never, ever told me a lie. But she did say, it's okay to tell a white lie. And so uh, she never told me. My dad physically beat me uh, as far as pants down over the couch, even in front of my sisters, and wailed on me. Okay, I mean wailed. I had bruises. I couldn't even shower in school. And so at 14, I pulled a knife on him. And I said, if you touch me, I always used to say, are you sure, Mom, that's my real dad? And I didn't even realize what I was saying because he would not let me look at his face. And when I did, when he's beating me, he looked so mean and mad, right? Uh, You know, a lot of people say, well, that's how that's how you you know, your dad made you what you are. No, I'd have been the president of the or the head of the FBI. Right. If I, if I wouldn't have turned right when I was 14 or turned left instead of right. I then joined, uh, uh, at 15, the Devil's Disciples, which was a sister club to the Hells Angels. We party together. So that's a 1%. At, that was a, you were a 1%er? Yeah. Outlaw? Yeah. Yes. And at 16, I became, because my daddy made me go to boxing. He was a champion boxer in the Navy. So 
to learn yes sir no sir i had to i've got a black belt i had to go to karate and then i had to box that is one thing he taught me so now you're in a motorcycle gang it seems like you're kind of going off in the wrong direction so you got in some trouble and you served 18 months in the texas state penitentiary what did you do and how old were you when you served time I was 23. I was Sergeant of Arms for the Disciples. I moved to Texas with my first wife, and I had never heard of Texas. And, uh, you know, I, when y'all come down here, I was like, what are they talking? And so as I was there, the two, three, two brothers, Disciples, because they were there too, they came. Some, uh, Ray Ray, my president, started a chapter in Pampa, Amarillo. And so one night they came to get me and we would go coyote hunting. I had a coyote collar. We'd shoot a lot of things, animals, right? Right. They came by to get me and uh, we said, you know, let's stop by Jerry, who I knew really good, Oliver's house, and buy some pot. So we pulled up. Donnie, my brother Donnie Cocteau, was severely drunk. Uh, I'm going to rob this guy. go, no, you're not. This guy is going to kill you. You know, he's... uh, he was a pimp and went to prison for pimping and pandering out of Texas. Okay. He'd been there twice. This is a tough guy, right? So my brother Donnie snuck a uh, 12-gauge single-barrel shotgun in the house in his jacket, and he didn't put a single barrel where you flipped it open. He didn't put the bottom wood stock on. Oh, no. And so he pulled it on Jerry. Jerry grabbed it. Uh, we're out in the car. We hear boom. And we're like, oh, my God, uh, Jerry shot him, right? Because it didn't sound like a shotgun. Mm-hmm. It was muffled. He comes running out of the house, full run, and his hand is all ripped up. So get him in the car. I say, go to the hospital. My sister Cheryl was driving, my, my disciple sister. So on the way to the hospital, he goes, man, I hit him in the shoulder. And I'm like, I told you don't hit that guy. He goes, no, I shot him in the shoulder. And I'm like, with what? And he's like, with the shotgun. And I'm like, oh, my God, get him to the hospital. I'm going to see Jerry. So I took him to the hospital, or they took him to the hospital, dropped me off at home. And so uh, Leland's mom and Dwayne Lee's mom said, what's going on? And we had a princess phone back then. And I called 911 to send the cops to Jerry's house. When I hung the phone up, it didn't hang up. Oh, no. So I told LaFonda the story, and I went over there. Jerry was alive, Officer Love, and he said to Jerry on the stretcher, who was it? And they pulled the thing off his mouth. He said, the devil's disciples. And I was like, oh, God. And then he goes, uh, Officer Love said, was it dog? And he goes, no, but it was his brothers. So, oh, good, I'm in the clear. The next morning, uh, the radio went off at 6.30 a.m., and it said, Dog Disciple, also known as Dwayne Chapman, is being sought for the shotgun massacre slaying last night in Pampa, Texas. Jerry died. Oh, no. So all of us were arrested for first-degree murder. And I'm still, that's okay. I'm raised in Colorado. That's okay. I didn't go in the house. Donnie didn't mean to. That's involuntary. Or maybe second or third-degree murder. Don't worry. Everything's cool. I get out on bond. The bond's only five grand. I'm like, I got it. I'm good. Go to trial in a year. Back then in Texas, in the 70s, 77, if you were there and did not call the police to report it, even though I called the ambulance, right? we didn't have 911 then. I dialed something else, right? Right. And for ambulance service, which was a little sticker on the phone. So my lawyer's like, well, he did call. No, he didn't. So the jury came back, unanimous decision, all took him a day, all of us convicted. So Granger McElhamey gave gave me five years in a day. So I go down to penitentiary. Oh, my God. Oh, my God is right. I've never seen nothing like that. I bet. I've been in county jails all over. Phoenix, uh, San Francisco. I never went to prison. So I was there thinking, oh, my God. So I say, God, that's it. I'm so sorry. I'll go back to my roots. So I became warden's barber. That is the most prestigious job in in the prison. Because if you touch the warden's barber, you're dead. Because the warden had to be looking good for visiting day when the girls all came. Okay. So this was your job while in prison, the warden's barber? Yes. Yep. 
the big warden, the warden of all the prisons in Texas, came to get a haircut. So he said, what are you in here for, son? Did you shoot the guy? Back then in the early 70s, if you shot a man that was with your wife, literally, you know, right. you had justifiable homicide. And I thought they, I think they called it, you know, some kind of feeling. I forget what they called it. So he said, is that what happened to your wife? You, you walked in on him? And I said, no, sir. So I told him the story, what I just told you. So the warden left, didn't say another word to me, and I didn't even realize that. And thank you for the haircut. And an hour later, the goon squad came and arrested me and put me in the hole. For so what? For lying to the warden. Oh, man. I go in, as soon as you go to jail or to the hole, you, within 24 hours, you get to have a kangaroo court, which is the warden, the mayor, or the lieutenant, a sergeant, and a couple guards. You sit across the table, uh, chained up from all them, right? Right. So they chained me up, set me down. And Warden Jacka, he's the head top dog. He never attends any hearings. And when I walked in, he's there. And I went, oh, I'm done. Yeah. You know, and so he said, sit, sit down. I sat down. He said, doggy. Yes, sir. You know that story you told me yesterday? I said, yes, sir, I do. Well, I happen to know your sheriff in Gray County named Roof Jordan. And he said, as a matter of fact, I knew his one-armed daddy. We were good friends. <laughs> And he said, as you know, the saying says, Roof Sr. had one arm, but he had a boy with two arms. Right. He said, you know, he used to fight them old rigger boys with that one arm and win every fight. And I go, okay, Warden, I've never heard that, but thank you, sir. May I comment? And, you know, you got to ask that. Yes, you may. I said, well, thank you, Warden. I didn't know that story. He goes, well, I called Roof yesterday. And I was like, oh, God. By God, doggy, he told me the same damn story you did. So you're in the clear now. And I said, listen to this. He said, dog, I know your birthday's February 2nd, which you call it Ground Dogs Day. <laughs> he said, but uh, I can change any order I want to. I'm hereby issuing you a clemency pardon, son. And wow. He said, on February the 6th, and I'm sorry, this here year, 1979. He said, I'm giving you a clemency party. And he goes, let me tell you something, boy. You get out there because you're going to be something, son. And you make Texas Department of Corrections proud. Oh, wow. And bam. So now you're out. You're a free man. And, yes. and, and then do you decide to become a bounty hunter? Or like what? what, where did you think your path was going to lead you. So I, one of my favorite shows was Wanted Dead or Alive, The Lone Ranger, all those kind of bounty hunter shows. And I went, and usually those guys had a pass and then they turned uh, into a good guy. I got out of prison. Warden let me out. February the 9th, I went to Denver because Texas wouldn't let me parole there. A couple weeks, I don't know how many, I went to the post office. I got the top 10 most wanted. There was no books to check out what is a bounty hunter because all I'd seen it was on TV. So I went into a, a police supply store and I lied and they and I acted like a detective. I go, hi, how you doing? I said 10-4 and all that, right? <laughs> right? Over. But the guy's like, what do you want on the badge? And I went, well, let's use my other undercover name, Dog Chapman. He goes, all right. And what's your, what's your badge number, Mr. Detective Chapman and I went oh god so I, I said oh in my mind fast <laughs> not social security number not date of birth not 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 so out of my mouth came 271097 okay <laughs> so two, seven, that's my prison number oh okay so still to this day I carry that it's my, uh, my first badge I put it in my baby girl's grave my second badge I have today, and it's still the same, Dwayne Dog Chapman, 27-1097. Wow. Yeah. Dog, what was your first job ever? How old were you? What was oh, your first job? And I don't care if it was uh, against the law or not, but I want to know, what was your very first job where you earned money? Well, I think it was cutting yards for my auntie and my grandma. Okay. We had push mowers, and Grandma would give me two whole dollars. Okay. And then I, my, my daddy was a, a Navy man, so I had to work to pay rent once I started using electricity and eating food. Because, you know, I was a stepchild, right? Right. 
My brother never had to do it. My half brother. That's what I remember as, you know, due to writing and all that, cutting yards. And then I went door to door. I became a number one Kirby salesman when I was a kid. A vacuum salesman? Uh, yeah. When I first got married, I was the nu- I started, I would talk my dad tried to out of beating me. I would go door to door and try, and ma'am, would you like your yard cut? I'll, I'll do your yard for you for 2 $3. Well, yes, young man, I sure will. Let me tell you, I was making more money than any kid my age, but I worked. So the, all that helped me become the number one Kirby salesman in the nation. And I still rode a Harley, put my hair back and pinned it before they even did that. And I went to farmers, mostly wives. And I would, you know, because they trusted me, I sold a woman's product and I went in and demonstrated it. And I barely ever missed a sale. I bet. I sold, yeah, I sold Kirby's because I had faith in the Kirby. Still do. I knew it was American made. I knew it could outdo, out clean any vacuum cleaner on the market. <laughs> so because of my confidence in what I was selling, I pumped it. Right. And of course, I had, a tra- I had a trainer that trained me a mentor on how to sell one of the greatest salesmen in the world, uh, Dale Newman Hunt. A door-to-door vacuum salesman. I, I, uh, I, did, uh, I didn't know that. That's, that's pretty cool. Are you thinking in prison because you got a lot of time to think, you know? You're reading the Bible, yeah. you're working out, and you're thinking. Did you ever think, though, man, what am I going to do when I get out of prison? Was there anything that you thought you would be doing instead of a bounty hunter? Was there something p- that you were passionate about that you just thought, oh, I think when I get out, I'm going to try to get a job doing this or that, or, or that didn't happen because bounty hunting just kind of came along while you were in prison. Well, I never thought bounty hunting. Okay. What I thought about was Ed Kirby, of course, cause I was successful, but you had, if you had a felony, you couldn't go door to door. Okay. With a woman product, especially murder. So that was out. Right. So the other one was in the Devil's Disciples back then, they called them the Dirty Dozen. And there was allegedly 12 that had been convicted of first degree murder. <clears throat> and they were a lot more respected and feared than any one percenter in the club. Right. So my options were the Dirty Dozen, and there was no other option. That was a life of crime. So it was a life of crime. Of course, I learned so much in prison on how to pick locks, how to cover up this and that. Right. I was taught by the best. I've always been mentored by the best, whether it be the Lord, a marriage, criminal activity. Uh, I had one of the most geniuses, IQ so high that was in prison, taught me so much about it. So I thought, well, I'm going to just, you know, I got to be a dirty dozen. I got to come out and be that. And, right. uh, you know, ask God before I take my last breath to forgive me. I'm so glad you went the other way, dog. Obviously, so oh, is a lot of oh, people. I want to know about your big break. So you're a bounty hunter. You're successful yeah. at it. How did A&E find you, discover you, and say, wow, look at this guy. He's got the hair. He's got the look. He's in Hawaii. How did, how did you get discovered and become a household name, Dog the Bounty Hunter? The FBI had a warrant on a guy named Ricky. And so I pulled over, and there's all these cars that look the same, and they all look like men in black back then, right? And I became, I started being trained also by the FBI, and I can say it now. And so I get there, they go, we're the FBI, where you've got a warrant for him. I go, well, search me so I can reach my pocket. So they do. And I go, you see this warrant? Is yours notarized, certified? They go, no, we've got, I go, sorry. And I turned around and walked away. Okay. Now, Rick, while they're, cr- before, the reason they're all crouched down because Ricky's shooting. I said, he goes, they yelled at me, don't stop. He shot at us three times. I go, three? No, he shot at us six times. I said, are you sure six? They go, yeah. I said, okay, I'm going the door. 
So I go up, they shut up, right? I knock on the door. Ricky, yeah, it's Dog Chapman. Ricky, you need to come out of here with your hands up, brother. These feds, they're feds. I go, they're going to boot this door in. They're going to put more holes in you than they did Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> He's like, dog, don't come in. I go, shut up. I kick the door right in. He's behind his couch. I go, Ricky, I see the couch. I know you're back there. You think that couch is going to stop a bullet? And he stood up with the gun to his side. And he goes, dog, don't let him take me. And I said, well, I'm going to take you. And he, I knew he was out of bullets. Yeah, right. big shots, right? right? And so I'm figuring all this out, right? So I arrest him. Don't cuff me, dog. Don't put the chains on me. I go, listen, my left hand, I cuffed his left hand to mine. We walked out the door. So the feds came running up, took him into custody. Dog, dog, I said, don't worry, brother. I'll help you. So the feds go, listen, the way you are is this guy like Tony Robbins. You know who's that? I go, no. He's a guru, blah, blah, blah. Well, I heard of Zig Ziglar and all them from Kirby. And they said he's the new modern Zig Ziglar. And I go, okay, uh, we want to tell him about you. So I get a call from Anthony Robbins. He's like, hi. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> Would you come to one of my meetings in Texas? I go, listen, I'm never going to step my foot back. <laughs> no way, yeah. Thank you. And he goes, for five grand, my mother goes, he'll be there. What day? <laughs> I go, and Martin Sheen is there. Candy, uh, the guy that died, the comedian's wife is there. She's an opera singer. The guy who wrote, uh, did Batman, uh, shoots, I forget his name. Him and his wife were there. So Martin Sheen, I start talking with Tony Robbins. We break up in groups. Because Tony made me take his class. So I'm with Martin Sheen, and he's like, let me tell you something, man. You need a TV show. I can't believe you're kicking mama. You're kicking the family door in and taking mama off the stove and dragging her to jail. I go, Martin, I don't do that because I don't arrest too many women because I take a woman with me at all times if I do a woman. Right. You know, thank you. He goes, I am going to hook you up. I did dirty jobs in the 90s. Oh, the show. Okay. Yeah. And A&E, Nancy Dubuque, called me, and several networks called me and said, it wasn't A&E, I did it for. And they said, listen, we need to give you a show. And Sharon, uh, Sharon and Ozzy, Sharon was my mentor then, and she said, listen, shoot from the hip, dog. Don't take any kind of scripts. I know you can't read, dog. Shoot from the hip, watch your language, and let it fly. Uh, I always say a prayer uh, because I got my babies there. So I always say, in Jesus' name, amen. So the network said, uh, you know, I won't mention them, the fake news network said, uh, you know, we don't mind if you pray, but we have a lot of different religions, so can you drop Jesus' name? I said, oh, sure, uh-uh. So Nancy that you could A&E, who offered the least of anybody, Honey Boo Boo salary. Right. And we'll let you say in Jesus' name and see how it goes. Third or fourth show, she brought me in and said, listen to me, dog. We don't care if you say in Buddha's name. You just broke Miss Gotti's record. Oh, that was uh, Victoria Gotti growing up. Gotti, Victoria that was Gotti. the big show on A&E at the time. And then yeah. Dog the Bounty Hunter became the number one show. Yeah, we broke her record. So she came up to the motel room. We're all at the Hilton in, in, in uh, New York and knock, knock, knock on the door. Out in the door, and there she was. Beautiful, right? And I go, hi. And she goes, I have a gut. And I go, I figured you might. Right. You're so lucky that I don't put a hit out on your ass. <laughs> and I go, why? She goes, you damn dog, you broke my record. That's so funny. We became, we became great friends. I bet. And then the last season with Beth showing her demise, which I can't uh, believe she did. I can't either. WCN. Yeah, and she was... She was always private, but I was like, Beth, you sure you want to show him? Yes. Very brave. She helped yeah. a lot of people, too. She do By doing that, she helped so many people. Well, she still is, believe it or not. Yeah. You know, she's, uh, that show is everywhere still. And, you know, uh, I get a lot of scruff. How could you ever get remarried? At, and I say in the book, you know, Beth brought me in the room a week before she died. Beth said, I'm going to die. I said, Beth, no, you're not. Quit claiming it. She said, I am going to die. <laughs> She said, Big Daddy, God has taken me out of your life. I go, Beth, no, he's not. She goes, she says what she said a lot. Shut up. <laughs> she goes, you know, you've been called to the ministry. And she says, I remember telling you one time, I'll never be a minister's wife. And it was actually a few times. And she said, I also know you're telling me that you won't get married. Yes, you will. 
And here's a list of 10 people that you better not marry. <laughs> and I, a week later, she, she went to heaven. A year and a half later, when I met Francie, uh, who has uh, lost her husband six months before I lost Beth, Bob, Francie had been a Christian for 15 years. And the day I pulled my truck over, I said, I need a Christian. I don't care what tribe she's from. I've had uh, a little heavy set, short girls, but I'd like a tall, skinny one, right? <laughs> Francie's 5'10 <laughs> and skinny. And she takes 138. She's, I told her the other day. You got dick, what is ever it's called, where you think you're skinny and you're, you think you're fat and you're not. Oh, anorexic. Anorexic, yeah. I'm not too good with words. Yeah, don't don't worry, me neither. <laughs> Dog, I I mean, first of all, I'm so sorry about Beth. I know you guys Thank were you. soulmates, and and I'm so happy that you found. Francie and you know you got to look yourself in the mirror and you're the only one that's judging you buddy and I you know and it seems like you know with the people saying what they're saying you know that probably bothers you but at the end of the day it's your life and your uh, your you know Beth wanted you to be happy you didn't choose yeah. that life uh you didn't choose Beth to to pass and no. I'm sure the only thing she wanted that. was for you to be happy. Yes, and and uh, you know, at first, you know, you told Beth you wouldn't get married. Yeah, well, I didn't want to tell everybody. I sure, sure I would. And then, uh, you know, we can't stand fancy she the when she tried to look like Beth. You know, both of them have big breastises, but how? You know, what'd she do? Get a breast implant? You know, fancy. <laughs> No. And then they'd say that to Beth. You need a, You had a too big of a breast implant, right? <laughs> and then, you know, they don't look at all alike. They got the same color hairs about it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of characteristics, nails, stuff like that. You got a type. Have. You have a type, man, you yeah. know? Oh, thank you. I'm going to use that. Yeah, I do. That, and that's, and that's, so, that's what that is. Yes. And now, where it was five out of ten that didn't like her, now I'm known, and I'm going to cry, as Mr. Francie, <laughs> because she is lighting up the, the church world. You ought to hear that woman speak. I'm telling you, man. And she was a rancher. Wow. She worked like a man. She is a, the most feminine girl I have ever met. So many things about her are so prissy, 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 prissy. And she can drive anything with a motor. And wow. she did plowing and all oh, man. And I stole her off the ranch. You know what I mean? That's awesome. And now people are going, you know, uh, we see dog that Beth sent Francie to you. Now, scripturally, I don't know. I think God did. But now they're saying, oh, dog, I see the love in your eyes, and I see the love in her eyes, and thank God you're happy again. You know, there's so many people out there that want to know uh, because the show's, you know, the show's been off for a minute and a lot of people have been asking me questions personally about right. baby Lisa, Leland, Dwayne Lee and Gary boy. Can you can give me a, I know yeah, you got so, 12 kids. I know you got 12 yeah. kids, dog, but those are the ones that we all know. So can you tell us uh, about baby Lisa, Leland, Dwayne Lee and Gary boy? First of all, in the new book, I got another son. Oh, no. Thirteen. He was, I was 15 and so was his mother. And I'll stop there and let you read it. Okay. Wow. So babe, baby Lisa, still my baby Lisa. And she lives in Hawaii. She's moving to Alabama. Uh, one, man, I got 27 grandkids and four grand, great grandkids. Now wow. that John's got five. My <laughs> oldest got five. I'm like, God, <laughs> I got a tribe, just like my daddy would say. So Lisa's living there. I'm in Florida. It's only seven hours. Right. Uh, next in line is, uh, well, first in line really is Dwayne Lee. Dwayne Lee was always, I'm Dwayne Lee, the, I'm, uh, you know, I'm Dwayne Lee Chapman the first. I'm Dwayne Lee Chapman the second to none. <laughs> because he was the oldest. And then Christopher popped up. Uh, I didn't know him till he turned 19. He was in jail. And the mother-in-law called me and said, you got a baby. <laughs> and I had, you know, I didn't even have to have DNA with Christopher. He looked so much like me. And so does John, but we did DNA. Francie made us. And so uh, Dwayne Lee is still mad at me over Beth. Okay. So we haven't spoken in a while. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. And God will make it right. Or when I die, he'll be so sorry, right? Right. How they get. Yep. 
and then son Leland is going after my record, the little squirt, and he is probably two to three a day or a week, and he works for all the bail bond insurance companies. Okay. Where I work for the bail bondsman. So he's got contracts, and he goes after them all over the world. He just arrested two weeks ago the number one skinhead in America. Oh, wow. He outran the cops within two weeks three times in a car. And where is Leland? Is he in Stone, Hawaii? No, he's in... uh, Arkansas. Okay. Yeah, he's in uh, Sweet Home. Let's see. Alabama, yeah, Arkansas. I get, I get Arkansas and Alabama mixed up. I do too. Leland, Dwayne Lee. And Gary Boy. Uh, Gary Boy is in Alabama, and he well, last week he is no longer a rookie sheriff. No uh, way. He, yeah, he took the You know, he's two, three, four years old on TV. Dad, I want to be a bounty hunter. I'm going to sneak in your boot. So many times we caught him in the back of the SUV hiding. And that boy, you know, as he turned 18, I took him on bounties on the show, right? And right. He, and so, you know what that kid did, man? He carried, like we were in Colorado then, uh, he carried the Colorado statue book around with him. <laughs> and he said on, on national television, the camera rolling, because we weren't allowed to cut, and he said, Dad, We've been gone 15 minutes, and you've done three misdemeanors, traffic <laughs> violation. <laughs> I'm like, Gary, you're such a cop. Would you shut up? You're being recorded. I don't care, Dad. Let the world know. And so then at 21, he, had, you know, that area, he took uh, four months or something. And, of course, he's dog the bounty hunter's son. Gary is 6'4", 265, big. Wow. You know, Gary thinks he can whip me, duh. But, uh, so, and then if you Google Gary's name, you know, I'm not bragging, but I'm just, uh, you know. You I should. Identified. You should. Two for the first week, I'm thinking it's the first day, but you have to Google it. On the job, he sees his car go by, so he looks really good. The lady's got a tail light out. So he's like, okay, probable cause, pull over. There's a little nine-year-old boy in the front seat. The lady's driving. Can I see your driver's license and insurance? Well, I've got a driver's license and no insurance. You know, I'm going to give you a ticket for that. I'm sorry, but i got to give you a ticket. Gary's very polite. Learn from Dad, right? Right, right. He said, what's your baby's name? And she goes, Roger. And he goes, no, it's not. It's Craig. And Gary goes, ma'am, I don't want to pull a gun on you, but you get out of the car right now. Right. So he said, I'm putting you in handcuffs, not under arrest, for, to protect me and you. She kidnapped the baby. Oh, no. And so they said, oh, my God, your first day on the job, Gary, what are you going to do on the second day? What could you do ever bigger than this? He goes, I'm probably going to have to arrest my dad. (laughs) I'm like, you punk. Oh, man, that is amazing. What a little kid, little blonde hair boy is now a police officer. That's such a great story, man. You are a New York Times best-selling author and a new book called Nine Lives and Counting, A Bounty Hunter's Journey to Faith, Hope, and Redemption. Thank you for mentioning New York Times. You can run, but you can't hide. Hit number one. I didn't even know what that meant. Then uh, you, where mercy is shown, mercy is given. Mother Teresa, a few of them beat me, so I'm like, all right, I'll give God the credit. <laughs> And so I heard William Shatner. I met him. I like him. He outran me up the stairs once. I think he's in his 90s now. <laughs> yeah, he is. He said, yeah, he said, you know what? He said, I haven't left a legacy. And I thought, what? Captain Kirk, you're known everywhere. He goes, so I'm going to write a book. And I went, oh. I had a guy the other day who read it because it just hit the market. And he read it. And he said, you know what? Dog, I felt like I was in the back seat with you. <laughs> That's great. I like, yeah. I was like, thank you, Lord. And you know, you don't make the money you used to make on books, okay? You know, books are almost a thing of the past. Yeah. You know, you just won't, you can't get rich by writing, you know, look at Bill O'Reilly's written so many, right? Right. But Bill, get, Bill, I've never met him. I'd love to. But Bill gets the story out there. So that you see it. It's a lot of people today have changed and don't write it for the money because there isn't that much. Right. So they write it to get their story out there. So 
uh, yeah, I was very proud and very proud of it. Uh, as you see, the first day, and they called and said Amazon's already sold out. Great. Great so news. Like, oh, thank you, Lord. The book is called Nine Lives and Counting, A Bounty Hunter's Journey to Faith, Hope, and Redemption. Uh, Dwayne Dog Chapman. You are now in the Tampa Bay area. Do you know that I also run a radio station in the Tampa Bay area? It's called 98.7 The Shark. So when you're in Mayaka out there... I want yeah. you to tune into 98.7 because it's similar to the the station I run in Fort Myers. Because um, on the way here, I had 96.1, and uh, three-quarters of the way here, I dropped. Yeah, so now you'll have to go to 98.7. And let me tell you something, Doug. I want to bring you in here. I want to show you the studio, and I want to do um, – let's do a big concert together where I can hire you to be the MC and um, – I'd definitely love to have a nice working relationship with you now that now that you're local. Thank you, brother. Love you. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you. And I really appreciate your time. Oh, right on, brother. Right on. And let's chat soon again, really. Please. Thank you, sir. And remember, I called you. You didn't call me. So I appreciate you letting me be on. Thank you. Thank you, dog. Take care, buddy. God bless. Aloha. God bless you, sir. Thank you. This is like such an inspirational story from, you know, the beginning when, you know, he he had a father who was very abusive. He just found out that was not his real father. He gets into trouble because of the abusive household that he lived in. He gets in trouble, joins a one percenter motorcycle gang when he is in his teens, which leads him to a conviction of first degree murder and does a few years in the 70s and has to turn his life around. He said his father wanted to burn his birth certificate. His mother was disappointed in him. He could have gone in one of two different directions. He could have stayed straight. He could have gone back to the life of crime. He stays straight. He becomes a bounty hunter. His first job he said mowing lawns, but be, uh, you know, a little bit after that, like a real job after, you know, being in the motorcycle gang and, you know, probably some criminal activity, which still counts as a job. He's a door to door Kirby vacuum cleaner salesman. Can you imagine if that guy with that haircut comes up to your front door, knocking on your door, wanting to sell you a vacuum cleaner? I don't know what I would do. I Probably just by judging him, if I didn't know him and didn't know what a great guy he is, I'd have probably closed the door and run away from him. But you don't want to run away from the dog. You know, his big break with A&E came through the likes of Tony Robbins, believe it or not, that big, tall, like, uh, guru, life coach. And I'm not sure how Dog got hooked up with Tony Robbins, but it seemed like, you know, by being a bounty hunter and catching some pretty important people, he, you know, met some pretty important people along the way. One of those people, Tony Robbins. And one thing led to another. He ends up getting little TV gigs. He said he did dirty jobs once in the 90s. And then he got the deal to become Dog the Bounty Hunter. And, um, you know, the guy is just a genuine, sweet guy. And I just love his honesty he talked about his ex-wife. I shouldn't say his ex-wife because they didn't divorce. He lost her. She passed away. Beth had cancer. She was a huge part of his life. She was a huge part of the show. And then Dog, of course, goes into, you know, finding love again and uh, marrying Francie. And I'm just so happy for him. And a lot of people, you know, including his, his own son, uh, are not speaking because of, I guess, how he married his new wife and uh, and the death of his his former wife, but um, that will all come through in the end. And Dog says God will take care of it. And um, he's a he's an interesting guy, a man of the Lord. His mother was uh, you know preaching the gospel to him at a very young age. It's very important to him, and it's one of the things I loved about the show, Dog the Bounty Hunter. He's kicking the door in. He's putting somebody's face in the ground. He's got mace in their face. And then all of a sudden, they're in the backseat of his truck, smoking a cigarette and saying a prayer. 
And, um, you know, he cared. It seemed like he was ready for, you know, kick the shit out of somebody right before he caught him. And when he did catch him, the compassion came out of this guy and the motivational speaking to these criminals that were on the run. I mean, it was a really, really inspirational TV show. I, I found a lot of entertainment out of it. And um, he explained where all his kids are today and what they're doing, especially if you remember the show, Dog the Bounty Hunter, young Gary boy was a, a young blonde hair, blue eyed boy on the show. He's now in his 20s. He's a sheriff's deputy in Alabama. And his first day on the job, he caught a kidnapper. Unbelievable story. I hope me and Dog the Bounty Hunter uh, become good pals because uh, that's how excited I was to speak with him and to know that he lives in the town that I live and, and work and, uh, and that he listens to my radio stations. So uh, that's pretty cool, I think. So a great episode of Celebrity Jobber. Once again, all the past episodes are online at CelebrityJobber.com. And please listen through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'd love you to subscribe, give us a five-star rating, and leave a review. It's very helpful to me. Man, the dog can really spin a yarn, can he? Wow, I could have talked to him for another two hours. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you once again for checking out the Celebrity Jobber podcast. And until next week, we'll see you then. I'm Jeff Zito.